Hi there and welcome to another in our series of uh, essay plans, taking key topics available and thinking about how we would structure and build a good answer to a 25 mark question. Here's the topic today, this is living standards and the question is an interesting one. To raise standards of living, countries should focus solely on raising GDP per capita. To what extent do you agree? Keep in mind here of course that there is always an evaluation hook and I think the key word in this question is going to be solely. And obviously you then need to come to a, a calibrated, reasoned, justified conclusion at the end. And we'll do that in a few minutes once we've focused on the, uh, the approach that we favour here, the peak and pie approach to writing a 25 mark essay question. So here's the question again. To raise standards of living, the country should focus solely on raising GDP per capita. To what extent do you agree? Always good to make a very clear introduction to the essay. So I would start by eliminating any waffle and just saying that the baseline measure for living standards is real national income, real GDP per capita adjusted for purchasing power parity. Give a quick definition. This measures the inflation adjusted value of goods and services produced within the country over a year. Measured in PPP adjusted terms, that takes tries to take into account variations in the cost of living between countries. So GDP per capita is your baseline measure. And then we're going to build uh, four peak and pie points. So peak and pie stands for point explained, a brief, very brief explanation of the point you're making. So start the paragraph. Then you build contextualized analysis to go with it. But then you try to evaluate that point, but the point included in the evaluation. And you keep doing this. Okay, so you make a point, contextualized analysis, then evaluate and go back and do the same again. Let's see how this works. First point is that success in increasing GDP per capita is important for basic living standards because it's a direct way of cutting extreme poverty. And of course, the World Bank's preferred measure of poverty, extreme poverty, is $1.90 a day PPP. Then build the contextualized analysis. The analysis I'm going to build uses the example of China. This is best exemplified by the progress that China has made in improving material living standards over the last two decades or more. And depends how much data you have to support your argument, but I'm going to use GDP per capita relative to the United States. And China has gone up from just 5% of US levels in 1992 to 25% in 2016. China has achieved upper middle income status. Uh, and the World Bank estimates that Chinese income per capita rose from less than $1,000 per capita in 1990 to just over 14000 in 2015. And obviously a huge increase. China reached all of the Millennium Development Goals by 2015 and the country is now ranked 90th of 188, 188 countries on HGI. Here I'm building the argument that GDP per capita is important because it lifts people out of poverty and helps to achieve development goals. However, evaluation point, however, focusing solely on GDP per capita may cause us to ignore increasing relative poverty inequality. And I'm going to add in some data there. In China, the Gini coefficient, the Gini index, which is 0.3 in the 1980s to 0.53 in 2013. It's coming down now, but from a high level, this is a big risk to social cohesion. And I'm also developing this evaluation point, but also big gender and regional inequalities, particularly if you understand your Chinese economy between coastal and interior areas. So what's the point here? GDP per capita, lifting it is important to reduce extreme poverty, but we may be ignoring inequality uh, if we just focus on per capita incomes. This might be a moment to put in an analysis diagram to support your argument, and the obvious one to use would be a Lorenz curve diagram, perhaps showing an outward shift of a curve relatively low inequality in orange here to a much higher level of inequality in green. Make sure you practice these diagrams well ahead of the exam so you can draw them accurately and quickly at the same time, fully labelled to make the point. Now we go back to our second peak and point. So my second argument, and by the way, I'm doing here, I'm developing three points for saying that GDP per capita is important in lifting living standards. A rising real GDP per capita is important as it allows more people to afford life-sustaining goods such as health, education, and it lowers the long-term costs of malnutrition, which if you've been following debates recently from World Bank reports, you'll know is a 
exerts an enormous cost on growth and development in the long term. Increasing GDP per capita is key to sustaining gains in human development. One chain of reasoning is that, and this is interesting phrasing, so one chain of reasoning is that this signposting to the examiner that you're going to build for them a chain of reasoning. And here we go, higher per capita incomes leads to increased consumption, which then helps to create new jobs, thus providing a flow of factor incomes for people in work. And if more people are earning regular wages and higher incomes, this will then contribute to rising tax revenues for government to pay for public services, including basic public and merit goods. It also allows the state to provide welfare. So hopefully you can see the chain of reasoning there that higher per capita incomes is important in giving uh, people uh, the incomes, the factor incomes, the regular income from work, which flows and feeds through to the government to help them fund basic public and merit goods and perhaps the embryonic stages of a welfare state. However, evaluation, improved GDP per capita does not guarantee signs of improvements in human development. And then I'm taking a couple of examples here. Equatorial Guinea has a per capita income of over $20,000 per head, but an HGI ranking of 138, well below that of China, for example. Although the per capita income is $7,000 higher. It's a country riddled with corruption and conflict. Qatar is the richest country on the planet in per capita GDP terms, but lies only 38th on the HGI index. That kind of contextual awareness is gold dust for an exam. Hopefully many of you will have it. Here's the data. This data is uh, one of my favourite uh, tables. It shows the countries whose HGI outcome is actually significantly below their GNI per capita ranking. Equatorial Guinea was mentioned by answer. Their GNI per capita ranking is 79 places higher than the HGI ranking. In other words, uh, they are not necessarily translating the, the high income per head into um, durable, sustainable improvements in development across the population. Uh, Kuwait, Gabon, UAE, etc. are good examples there to include. South Africa is another good example, of course, in part because of the the deep inequalities. My third point, I'm going to build in three points for here saying that GDP per capita is important. Third justification to focus on high GDP is that it, it, it can raise the level of private savings and investment, which is important for future economic growth. Now, I need to justify this, I need to analyse it. And to do so, I'm going to bring in the Howard Dermar model of growth. The Howard Dermer model emphasises the role of savings to help fund investment. In many lower and middle income countries, gross national savings is insufficient to fund investment. So if policies are successful in lifting GDP per capita, then an increase in savings leads to an expansion of that investment, which helps to grow a country's capital stock. And then I'm building the virtuous circle idea. The extra investment helps hopefully to increase real GDP, which supports further increases in incomes and consumption. Now, I'm not putting any, necessarily any data in, but I'm mentioning two countries here, India and Indonesia, both have uh, a high level of saving investment as per capita incomes rise. But of course, I need to evaluate. One problem with this argument, that's, by the way, that's a, a, a neat evaluative phrase. One problem with this argument is that in many countries, financial institutions, banks, stock exchanges, etc., are not efficient at allocating capital to productive uses. And many of the gains from rising incomes actually don't flow to investment. They flow to elites who may send the money out of a country, capital flight, rather than retain it for domestic investment. So an increase in per capita incomes does not necessarily drive investment going forward, investment in productive uses. Now what I've done so far in this essay is I've built three points which say that per capita income is important for living standards hopefully using some good analysis there. But I've also evaluated and said, actually, no, there are three, there are three negative, the three downsides of this, of those arguments. My fourth point, actually, is just to twist it slightly and say, actually, no, uh, government should not focus solely on GDP per capita because, and this is something that many students will be familiar with, it is an inaccurate indicator of changes in the standard of living. And then, again, this provides you with an opportunity to build quite a flowing paragraph, which might put together two or three points relevant to the inaccuracy or the, or the, uh, the, um, the way in which GDP is not necessarily a, a, uh, an appropriate kind of living standard.
Firstly, per capita GDP understates real living standards, it tends to understate it, due to the shadow economy, the value of unpaid work by volunteers, people caring for their families. In fact, were we to include, and some countries now do, these, these it's imputed estimates for the value of, of home care, for example, GDP per capita would be much higher. Higher per capita incomes, however, might also have come from longer working hours, which negatively affects quality of life. So GDP per capita perhaps overstates living standards. GDP per head also increases when we spend money defensively, protecting against crime, insurance, for example, cleaning up the effects of pollution and waste actually adds to GDP, doesn't really add to our welfare. And there are also big difficulties in accurately measuring the true value of welfare that we derive <coughs> from consuming products, for example, for free on the internet. YouTube videos, Facebook connections, Snapchat stories, etc. Many economists now see GDP as deeply flawed. So I'm trying to build a point here for saying, hang on a minute, we can't rely solely on GDP because actually GDP as an indicator itself is, uh, is inherently flawed. However, we then have to evaluate that point. We can, and many economists do, make adjustments to GDP to take into account of these criticisms. For example, and it depends on which other indicators you've looked at in your lessons, but the genuine progress indicator, GPI, adjusts for environmental costs and benefits and surveys of also of people, people's measured happiness and well-being. HDI data for most countries is now adjusted to take into account gender and income inequality. Instead of looking at years of life expectancy, for example, we might focus on years of healthy life expectancy. Instead of just looking at years of expected and mean years of schooling, we might look at quality of education outcomes in terms of basic literacy, functional literacy, for example. So there are ways in which we can take, we can recognise the flaws in GDP, but also perhaps move the debate on a little bit. Think about adjustments to, improvements to, amendments to the national income data. That's not, it's not impossible, and there are lots of economists working in this area. So in this essay, we have focused on four, essentially four key arguments. For each, we've contextualised the analysis, but then we've also tried to evaluate the point. So we've already had four evaluation points straight away, and now we come to the final reason comments. It's important in the, in the essay to come to a final reason comment. Some exam boards want you to look at costs and benefits of something or short and long term perspectives. It obviously depends on what the question is. The example I teach looking for a student to make a final comment which hopefully says something relatively fresh rather than just goes over the same ground again. But take advice from your teachers about the best approach for your particular example. Here's my answer. Here's my final reason comment. It's a chunky paragraph, but let me take you through it and hopefully it might be useful. Overall, I would argue that. Now, that's quite a nice phrase to use to start your final paragraph. Overall, I would argue that. And then you're going to justify your arguments. Changes in GDP are an inadequate measure of human well-being. Some economists argue that we should now concentrate on median real disposable incomes. Instead of moving from GDP per capita, average measure, let's move to median incomes rather than income per capita. This allows us, for example, to consider the effects of taxation and inequality. The Legatum Institute is devoted to prosperity in this and the Kingdom of Bhutan, as many of you will know, has for the last 40 years or more published an annual Gross National Happiness Index. GDP is an important indicator, not least because it reflects the productivity of an economy and we should not ignore it when assessing the standard of living. But, and here's my kind of key point, material welfare is not the same as economic and social well-being. From health to education and the sustainable stock of natural capital that we leave to our future generations. Wellbeing is a multi-dimensional idea. That's a crucial point in my essay. That GDP alone cannot measure. And then you come, again, thinking about the way in which you can bring an essay to an end. Uh, come back to your main point. So I would favour focusing on progress in the middle of the income distribution. And therefore I would replace GDP per capita with median household income as my main measure. That is sending quite a strong message to the examiner that I've settled on a particular indicator as my, if you like, my guiding light for household living standards. It may or may not be possible to get all that data on median household income, but that's what I want to use as my main measure. 
So I've come to quite a firm conclusion. Okay, so that is my approach to this particular question. There's lots of different approaches you can take, but hopefully it gives you a little feel and a flavour for how we can use the peak and pie approach to answer these questions. There are lots of these essay plans now on YouTube. We're going to be adding lots more before the exams. So keep checking out our YouTube channel, subscribe and uh, hang around. Hopefully we'll, there'll be another question along soon which will help you in your, uh, your progress towards the exams. Cheers now, take care. See you soon.